Welcome to the Burden and Blessing Podcast, a study and discussion forum on the truth of God's Word. Our Bible study series examines a specific part of God's Word of Truth. We pray that through this study your faith will be built up and you will grow in your knowledge and understanding of God's Word through what you hear. Welcome back to our Burden and Blessing Podcast. Over the last six months or so, we have been doing a series where we have been learning a little bit about the apostles of the New Testament, those men who followed Jesus. And we have been taking them on the days in which the church remembers or celebrates those individuals. So today on May 1st, there were actually two different apostles who the church remembers on this day. The first is Philip. Philip is a little bit confusing because there are a number of Philips throughout the New Testament. There is Philip, the apostle, and then there's also Philip, who was the deacon. But we're going to be taking a look at what the scriptures tell us about this Philip. And there's a lot of things that are really beneficial for us to learn from these apostles, varying gifts and abilities and diff different things that the scriptures tell us about. So we're going to be digging into Philip the Apostle today. Joining me once again in order to go through our study of the Apostles is Pastor Mark Tiefel. Mark, glad to have you with us once again as we're going through and learning about these individuals that the Lord called to follow him and to proclaim his message of salvation both then and through their words that are left to us still today. Yeah, looking forward to getting back into the study here. So let's let's talk a little bit about when we start these, we usually talk a little bit about what the scriptures actually tell us about these individuals. Sometimes we have a lot of information about the apostles, and sometimes it's just a little. What do we know about Philip from the scriptures themselves? Well, Philip's one of the apostles that we have a few stories about. Um, we're given a, you know, more, more accounts about Philip than many of the other disciples. But as far as the actual uh, details of his life, we don't have as much information. Um, basically, everything that we have about Philip comes from the Gospel of John. So it's pretty easy to track through the Gospel of John what we know about Philip. Um, and right away in John chapter 1, what we see is he's the first official disciple to be called by Jesus. Now, Jesus has an interaction um, in John chapter one earlier with Andrew and Simon Peter, but Philip was the first person that Jesus said, uh, follow me too. So the first official, as we have it recorded in the scriptures, call to follow him was given to Philip. And so sometimes he's known or remembered as the first apostle in that sense, even though he wasn't the first one that Jesus interacted with. But John chapter 1 also tells us that uh, Philip was from the town of Bethsaida, which was also the same hometown as Andrew and Simon Peter. So it's quite likely that Philip knew Peter and Andrew growing up there in Bethsaida with them. And that is almost a reason why he's brought into the discussion there in John chapter 1 um, after Jesus interacts with Andrew and Peter. So let's stop there for just a minute, Mark. For those, I mean, we have a lot of these towns and locations that we hear and read about a lot in the Bible. But for somebody who just, they've heard the name Bethsaida, but they don't know anything about it. Can, can you give us just a little bit of information about, you know, where would we find Bethsaida? Uh, you want to just share a little bit of information about that just to kind of place it for us? Um, yeah, I believe, well, Bethsaida would, was up in Galilee, so it wasn't down in the, in the central region of the Jewish area by Jerusalem. Um, it was up in near, near the northern region in there by Galilee, which is where we know Jesus spent quite a bit of his time in his ministry up there in Galilee. Um, but I think from a cultural perspective, the people of Galilee were somewhat looked down upon as perhaps backwater um, or less significant than the people in the southern regions of Judea. And so it is interesting that the, the, the primary disciples that Jesus calls here in John chapter 1 are all from that region of Galilee up there. Now, as far as exactly where Bethsaida was on the Sea of Galilee, I'm not sure if I know that off the top of my head. It, you know, we know of other towns up there, Capernaum, um, Nazareth, but as far as 
where it is in that proximity. I'm not sure off the top of my head. Do you know? Yeah, Beth say it is on the northern shores, and it, it like you said, it's uh, more of a Gentile region. So it's it would be on the north eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee. Again, t you look at it today and it's actually, they've uncovered the ruins of Bethsaida. It's quite a ways away from the Sea of Galilee today because the level has gone down, but it's pretty neat to see some of the ruins of the city that they found of Bethsaida. Another example of the accuracies of scriptures being verified in archeological evidence. Mm, so yeah. it, would, it would make sense then that these fishermen like Andrew and Peter and James and those guys that they would have been from that town. It would have been a fishing village at the time. And and it seems pretty certain that Philip was at least familiar with some of these other disciples that we are more familiar with in the scriptures. Well, it's a, that's also an interesting point because there is some speculation about whether Philip had a Gentile background as well. It, Philip being a Greek name. Um, and some one of the stories where he he interacts with Jesus concerning a matter about the Gentiles too. Why don't we go into that? I know that's not the, the next one that we would typically cover chronologically in the gospel of John, but since you bring it up, let's, let's go into that. That's from John chapter 12, right? Yep. John chapter 12. You want to take us into that and discuss that just a little bit? Yeah. So it's a really interesting account where uh, Jesus has entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. So we're here at the end of his ministry on Holy Week. And John chapter 12, just the preceding context there, is the actual account of Pentecost, or, or I'm sorry, of Palm Sunday, where Jesus enters Jerusalem. Um, and then what we're told is that because it was the, around the time of the Passover in Jerusalem, there were obviously a, a, several different types and groups of people there in the city at that time. And John goes into a story where there were some Greek people in Jerusalem at that time. And they want to see Jesus. They want to hear about Jesus, maybe see a miracle perhaps. And so they seek out Philip, John tells us, um, and they say they want to see Jesus. And so then Philip goes to Andrew and Andrew and, and Philip come to Jesus and talk to him about that. And that's an interesting account where Jesus uses that as an opportunity to talk about how he's about to be glorified through his death and resurrection. That's the real Jesus that you'll see, not so much the miracle worker per se, um, or the sage teacher, we might think that that many people thought Jesus to be, but the actual son of God to offer his life down. So Jesus uses that that opportunity of uh, inquiry by those Greek speaking people uh, to use as a, a witness of the gospel, essentially. And Philip was a tool that that was used. I'm not sure if Philip realized the answer that Jesus would give there. Uh, but the Lord used him in that opportunity as a point of contact with those Greek people. And so that's another story where having the name Philip, Greek name, um, also being from the northern region of Galilee. John tells us again in chapter 12 that Philip was from Bethsaida in Galilee. And then the fact that these Greek people sought Philip out have all led us to wonder perhaps Philip had maybe a mixed family of Jew, Gentile, maybe a Greek father, some ancestry uh, of, of the, the Greeks in his, his bloodline. Uh, an interesting thought to consider. Well, let's, let's take a look at the application on that before we jump into another account regarding Philip. So here you have people that are coming to Philip and they're asking, literally, take us to Jesus. We want to, we want to meet Jesus. Uh, that's some pretty important application for us today because there are, there are going to be times in our lives where people are going to know our relationship to Jesus, you know, whether we go to church and the way that we act and things like that. So talk a little bit about the application to those, to, to what Peter or to what Philip does here along with Andrew and the others and how that applies in our lives. Well, I think one application is be ready. Like you said, there people will, people will see things about our lives. People will, um, at times, some, some relationships may know what our confession is, what our faith is, what church we belong to. And being ready, as Peter writes in his letter, to give a defense for the reason for the hope that is in us. Um, and that's really what Philip did here in that sense. Not that they were questioning him about a matter of his faith, but just leading somebody to Jesus. And Philip kind of had that same mentality in John 1, too, didn't he? Because he, he, as soon as he was told about Jesus and Jesus said, follow me, Philip went and told Nathaniel about it. So 
we already see within him this desire to freely speak about Jesus to others, a good quality to have. And part of that is being ready in the moment, not being in, intimidated by that. Uh, but I also think we see here, bring others with you too. use the resources that you have, use the people that you have. From a faith perspective, we might think of our fellow Christians, be ready to rally together as a group and work together because Philip here takes Andrew with him when it when he is given this request we don't know why we don't know why philip didn't just go directly to jesus but there was some obviously having grown up with andrew again in bethsaida there was probably a friendship there a, a trustworthiness where uh philip went to seek andrew's counsel on it and they took the matter together to jesus maybe philip was worried that you know it was too important of a week for jesus to be bothered by this we don't know but he, he went he went and used the christian friends and and contacts and relationships that he had as he gave a witness to Jesus. And I think that's another point of application for us as well in our lives is use the people God has put in your faith life, those people that are there encouraging you, supporting you in your fellowship um, to go and, and do that work together. Well, speaking about relationships with other fellow Christians and sort of building off of that, Let's go to the next occurrence, which is just later on in that same week in John chapter 14. This would have been on Monday, Thursday evening. Jesus would have been having a discussion with his disciples. He's trying to prepare them for what is about to come. Do you want to take us to the, the place in John 14, Mark, where we have Philip mentioned in that account? Well, it's right after one of the most well-known passages in the Bible and certainly in the Gospel of John. In John 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And he's having this discourse with his disciples here about things that are coming up. At the very beginning of the chapter, he talked about preparing heaven for them through his death and resurrection, that that's how he was making those that preparation happen. And so interspersed with this teaching that Jesus gives his disciples here are these comments back from some of the disciples about kind of the puzzled nature of, of this dialogue between Jesus. And right after verse six there, um, Philip comes in and says, Lord, show us the father and that is enough for us. So there's, the, you know, the disciples are kind of confused here about what Jesus is getting at and, and what his words mean. And I think Philip, in a, a practical way, wants to try to simplify it in some ways and says, Jesus, just show us God and we'll follow you to do whatever. You know, what, I th you, th you think in Philip's mind, he's probably thinking, why all this, this instruct, instruction and this teaching language? Why not just you know, show, us, show us your glory openly, Lord? I think it's a natural question. But what Jesus was doing here, obviously, was preparing them for even after his death and resurrection as they would they would take up the work of the church as the 12 disciples. So um, Jesus's re response there to Philip is a bit, you know, forward where Jesus says, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? And so and then Jesus says, the one who has seen me has seen the father. So we get we get gather here that Philip was, you know, inquiring about a more direct sign from Jesus. Just show us the Father. And what Jesus was doing was showing him, you have seen the glory of the Father. You've seen it through his servant, through me, as a member of the Trinity, obviously, as well. And so helping Philip understand, don't get so hung up on what you think you need to see, even if it is practical in human terms, but focus on what I am choosing to give you. And obviously there would be no, as, as Jesus said to the Greek people too, earlier that week, there would be no greater display of his power than what he was about to do on the cross. And he was keeping his disciples focused on that moment. So there's a little bit of a negative aspect to, Peter, to Philip's question here in that it demonstrates that he had a lack of understanding and Jesus points him in the right direction. But there's also a positive aspect of Philip's words too. What what are the positive aspects of what Philip says there in that verse? Well, I think one of the positives that comes out from the way I see it is a desire to 
heed the words of Christ. You know, Philip's not being negligent with his faith in this sense. He's taking the matter seriously. Was he a bit misguided in, the, in his question? Yes, and Jesus steers him back in the right direction. But certainly Philip cares enough about the matter to ask the question. And so I think there's a, we, we, you know, that there's an application of that for our faith life where we don't want to be paralyzed by the fear of, you know, might being exposed as, you know, maybe not knowing as much as we think we do, or maybe asking the wrong question. Sometimes we, we don't say anything about our faith or maybe don't take it as seriously because we don't want to be seen in that light. But there's a, there's a quality to Philip's expression here where he's not worried about that. But in this moment of wondering what's going on, he asks a question. And so when you're, when you're curious about where the Lord might be leading you, go, go to him in prayer. Seek out the advice of those he's put in your life, pastors, teachers, parents, Christian friends. Um, sometimes the best way when you're confused about something is just to start asking about it and to start seeking people's input on it. But when you do that, you you have to open yourself up a bit too, don't you? So Philip opened himself up in what, what was going through his mind. He was misguided. Jesus corrected him. But it's good in that moment that Philip said something because it showed that he cared. I think there were a lot of moments where the disciples were confused, but they didn't necessarily follow up on it. And I think that came back to hurt them in the end. Then let's go to another account. This is this might be the most familiar of all of them. This is the most that we have about Philip in John chapter 6. It's the familiar account of the feeding of the 5,000. And Philip has, plays a pretty prominent role in John's gospel in the dialogue between Jesus and Philip. And it almost seems as if the Lord is using this as an opportunity with Philip. Do you want to discuss that account just a little bit? Yeah, it's a really interesting thought here. And, you know, again, it builds on the other sections that we've seen because it's, it's almost as if Jesus knows that Philip is a thinker. He's going to consider what's going on. And so we're told here in John chapter six, before Jesus gets to the actual miracle, they have the problem that's encountering them. And that's the fact that they're out kind of in the wilderness and they have all these people that need food. And so uh, Philip is the first person that Jesus comes to and he asks him, where can we buy bread for these people to eat? Now, it's a very straightforward question, but John informs us that Jesus was testing Philip because Jesus already knew what he was what he was going to do. Obviously, we we knew that even if John didn't tell us. But John fills us in here in the gospel account that there's actually a, a purpose behind this other than just to figure out where they're going to get the bread. And so Philip, in a very again very practical, thinking it through logically, he says, "Well, we've got two hundred denarii worth of bread, but that would not be enough for so many people that we have." So Philip's answer is. Basically, I don't know. <laughs> you know, he, he, he tells Jesus what the inventory is, but clearly it's not enough to fulfill the task. And so I think the test from Jesus was the opportunity to confess that, Jesus, you can provide for these people. Uh, testing Philip in that way to see if Philip would respond in that way. And I think it was another learning moment for Philip where you know, it's hard to fault him for answering the way that he did. He was thinking about it very practically, but Jesus extends beyond what we consider to be practical to what he is able to do as God, and which he would shortly show uh, in this miracle, obviously. But it was an opportunity for Philip there to confess, you can, you can provide, Lord, do so. Uh, but he didn't, and I think that was another opportunity where he learned. One of the things that I have really enjoyed about the study so far of these different apostles is learning from the the tiny little things in the scriptures that a lot of times we just simply overlook, but are so telling. Number one, about an individual's characteristics or qualities or gifts, and maybe even more so, Mark, how the Lord in his love and concern for these individuals, develops those gifts and leads him along the way. That's been one of my favorite things. And we see that with Philip, don't we? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's, a, it's an act of the Lord's love, you know, that he, that he would take the time to do that. And he does that in our lives too, which is why this can be such a practical application for us as well. But I think in the moment when you're going through those situations, you might think, well, why is God doing this to me? 
well, why does it like like Philip said, why isn't God just more open about it? Just show us, Lord. But the Lord leads us along for our benefit because that's how we learn and grow in our faith. The lessons are learned best in moments of trial and difficulty. All right. So backing up just a little bit in the first chapter of John, that's where we're introduced to Philip to begin with. We're told that he has this relationship with Nathaniel. Uh, let's get into that just a little bit. What, what was the relationship between Philip and this other disciple, uh, Nathaniel? Um, well, Philip goes immediately to Nathaniel and witnesses. He, Nathaniel is the first person that he goes to uh, when Jesus tells him to follow him. So, you know, we've, we've, we, we've covered Nathaniel before, and, you know, obviously he's one of the 12 as well, where, where John chapter 1 gives us information about his perspective of following Jesus. But by the way that Philip witnesses to Nathaniel, we see that Nathaniel was aware of who the, who the Messiah was and was looking for that person. And because Philip's testimony to him is we have found the Messiah, the one that Moses wrote about, the one that the prophets testified about, Jesus of Nazareth. So I think we see there Philip and, and Nathaniel had some type of relationship ahead of time too. Obviously they knew each other um, and were well known enough where this was the person that that Philip went to when he first testified about Jesus and they had they you could tell that they had a knowledge of the Old Testament as well that they were on the lookout for these things now these two not only do they have a close relationship as brought out in John chapter 1 but as we often touch on in these studies, we find out that from early church history, we can learn a little bit more about what happened after the conclusion of the writing of the New Testament. And there are traditions that tie Nathaniel and Philip together also. They could have been brothers, right? I mean, it's possible, like some of the other apostles were brothers together. They could have been just very good friends growing up. We don't know that for sure. There's also some interesting information about their travels together. Do you want to touch a little bit on, on the, the things that they did together, according to tradition, uh, what happened with Philip and Nathaniel afterwards? Well, it's believed by some that they traveled together as missionaries, um, that they set out together, um, and they that they traveled to the region of Phrygia. Um, and so to give our readers a bit of biblical perspective with Phrygia, Colossae would have been a city in that region. So uh, the letter to the Colossians would have been written to Christians in that area. And so it's believed that one account says that they traveled there and ministered there as, as missionaries together. Uh, again, perhaps building off that friendship that they had before uh, Jesus even came to them. And as you mentioned, perhaps they were even related. Um, what's interesting too about that tradition is that some even add in their Philip's sister that traveled with them um, and and you know that they went together as a group and there's legend legendary accounts then of how they were supposedly martyred together um, one interesting one that says that they were crucified upside down together uh, and that Philip witness to the crowd and the crowd was so moved by their witness that he was going to they were going to release them uh, and take them down from the cross and that philip told them just to take nathaniel down that seems like quite an extraordinary account if that's true i i i tend to doubt it personally but um you know it fits in line with that thinking about philip of being kind of a go-getter not afraid to speak what's on his mind um, I'm not sure Nathaniel would have settled for that either if his friend said, okay, you get to come off the cross and Nathaniel would have said, okay, that's great. Okay, you, you're going to stay up there and die. I don't think that, you know, so those are the things that make you wonder. But um, yeah, it is interesting that in church tradition, Philip and Nathaniel are connected together very similarly to how they are connected in scripture. So speaking of things that are certainly unexpected, like you were talking about the crucifixion, the up down, upside down crucifixion, uh, asking for one to be taken down. Uh, there's also another interesting legend about Philip with animals. You want to talk a little bit about that one? 
Yeah, one of the one of the legends talks about how on their missionary travels, Philip, Nathaniel, and Miriam Nee, which is Philip's sister, that they came across a leopard and a goat that spoke in human words. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the substance of that tradition was, but that was the that was the uh, the the story anyway. And then another another tradition, another legend of a different time said that they encountered a dragon uh, which they slew they killed um, and so it's interesting that the region that they went to Phrygia um, the people there did have a false idolatrous worship in a serpent like God and so it's 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 wondered by people if the story was a metaphor for having a you know, kind of destroyed that false religion with the gospel and, you know, slaying the serpent in that sense. But some traditions say it was an actual dragon. And Philip is kind of known for that in church tradition. He's always connected in that way to serpents or dragons or lizards because of that account. Um, but again, kind of an interesting thing to consider when you get into that realm of tradition, you, you hear some fascinating stories. You don't always know what to believe, but even sometimes when the stories are mythical, there is a connection to them. They're grounded in some way to what we know about the, the person from the scripture. It's, it, and I think that's where some of the legends build off, but you know, maybe some of these stories are true. Maybe they're not, but it's, they're interesting to consider when we think about the lore surrounding these 12 apostles. And once again, almost always, even with these, let's call them legends about the apostles, nine times out of 10, they tie in very nicely with what we do know about the apostles. So it's not like they're undermining what we already know. They're really built on the characteristics, qualities, uh, locations, you know, all of those things about the apostles. So uh, like you said, there, you know, it could be an analogy at some, at, in some cases, um, in describe and, and the, the scriptures are full of those, you know, metaphors that we have as well. So uh, very interesting. Well, let's go back and, and let's, let's go back to what we do know. We have learned a number of things about Philip through our study of the actual scriptures themselves. What's our takeaway, Mark? What is, what, what's the legacy that that Philip gives to us in the qualities that he has, what can we take away from the life of Philip and apply in our own lives today? Yeah, I think Philip to me is one of those apostles where we really see some clear and deep application to our lives today. Sometimes it's, you know, we, there's always lessons to learn from, from every, every one of these individuals that we are looking, you know, that we are studying. But I think Philip really strikes me as very applicable to our lives, first of all, because there's a, there was a boldness to Philip, a, a boldness to speak. He witnessed to Nathaniel about Jesus. He took Andrew with him when, when questioned by the Greeks. When Jesus was on, on Monday, Thursday, when Jesus was talking about the end um, with his death, Philip spoke up and, and wanted to know more. And so I think the one quality that we take is he left a legacy of being bold. And, and kind of similar to, we know that the apostle Peter was bold as well, but Peter bordered more on the, 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 the uh, border of reckless at times. Um, and so what you see with Philip is a bit more of a practical boldness, a bit more of control where he did diligently think about things. He thought that he thought it through. And sometimes the way he thought things through perhaps limited what Jesus was able to do, but it shows that he was taking it seriously. And I think for, for our day and age where so many people want to be seen as practical and reason-based and that they're willing to think things through, that you can see how that's compatible with one's faith. You can you can be a practical person and a, a reason-based person and still be a person who trusts in Jesus. You have to be aware of the dangers there. Some of the things that did trip that did trip Philip up, but you see in his attitude how that that works out very well. To be a Christian is not to be someone who just follows on blind faith. Um, even even when we submit things to God, there is a rationale behind that. And then I think the second thing that comes out with Philip is 
the value of relationships and friendships in the faith. Uh, we all have different types of relationships in our lives. Um, but I think the ones that are connected to our faith are extremely important for our lives and they're, they're blessings from the Lord um, that we share that common bond with another person that we can experience the trials uh, and discouragements of life with another person that they can lift us up and uh, bring us the message of Christ in, in difficult times. Those are all such great blessings to have. And you see, Philip was somebody who surrounded himself with others and, and used those relationships in his faith for his benefit. Um, even, even as far as we know with church tradition up to the point of his death uh, with his relationship with Nathaniel. So um, to me, those are the main things that stick out that are really well-grounded applications in scripture that we can take for our lives yeah those are those are excellent when you take a look at all of the things that we've learned from the different apostles that has been a theme that has come up in examples with the other apostles too at times is the the value and the importance of that christian fellowship that we share with others and being encouraged and built up in the faith we we aren't an island we we need that support of other Christians, and that's why the Lord gives us the fellowship that we have, is to be encouraged not only in his word, but also by our fellow apostles, our fellow Christians today, and to be able to face the difficulties and the trials. It's a, it's a discouraging work in, in this fallen world, and to have the support and encouragement of other fellow Christians is so, so vital in our, in our work today. Well, thank you, Mark. Looking forward to getting through and studying some of these other apostles as we continue our series through the apostles of Jesus. Thank you for your time. We pray that this study has been a blessing for all of you, our listeners, and hope that you'll join us as we continue growing in our knowledge and also in the application of what we can learn from these men who were called to follow Jesus. We hope that you will join us again next week for another episode of Burden and Blessing Podcast as we continue to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Until next time, take confidence in your Savior's promise that he will always be with you, even to the end of the world.